These are on your chair, that you got them on your way in, or you're sitting on it. Um, I hope that you did this last week. Last week was on consecration, and we have the video that goes along with it. And as we did this, uh, it's really strange for me to sit down and go through the stuff that, uh, that we have prepared, and then to actually sit down and watch a video of me talking is, is weird. Um, but you know what? To actually go through these together with other people and to talk through it, to engage with it, this is one of the ways we're really encouraging you to become part of this spiritual journey in this, these six or eight weeks through our campaign. I really believe, as I'll say later, uh, I really believe that this is more about what God will do in us and in our church than it is about expanding our building. I wholeheartedly believe that. And so I want us to engage in these things, in consecration and in faith, in stewardship, in sacrifice, in thanksgiving, and all of these things are discipleship issues. These are the way of Jesus. This is the life he's called us to, and let's focus on those things. Let's become open to whatever God has as we take steps in, in living the way he's asked us to live. And so I really want us to make about, uh, it about that. This is just one of the things that we're encouraging you to do. As I prepared for this week, I read a story uh, of a man who lost his job and had a young family. And over the weeks uh, that that ensued, uh, no job opportunities came, and it became more and more desperate and uh, became really difficult just as a family and struggling. Uh, As they continued to pray, they continued to trust God, but as week goes into week, it becomes more desperate, right? Right? And then uh, he had an accident in his garage and lost four of his fingers. And the immediate response, as it probably would be for us, is, is God, what's going on? You know, we're trusting you. This is difficult. And then it goes from bad to worse. How does this happen? Well, for weeks they were in and out of the hospitals, many surgeries, and lots and lots of prayer. In the end, they were able to reattach all four fingers in a working manner. And they they took that as a clear, miraculous answer to prayer. And so I want us to to feel the tension between that this morning, because here they're still living in this struggle. There is still no job. Uh, He's still recovering. And yet in the middle of that, God is at work. And God is doing amazing things in their lives and teaching him how to depend on God. And there's some things that he said In the midst of this, in this story, he said, and I quote, We live a life of faith because we know that God has got this. And you know, as long as this goes and as long as their struggle goes, because God is answering prayer and God is doing these miraculous things, it doesn't take the fear away. It doesn't take the, you know, that I still need a job. But God is there and God is alive and well. And and this next quote Interestingly, this week, my wife and I had a conversation about this in a very similar way. But he said, everything that comes my way has passed through God's hands. Whether it's brought by God or whether it's brought by the enemy, God is aware and God has got this. He said, the storm may rage, but I know that he has this and he has me. So I can rest. I can rest. How do we do that? How does somebody who's had weeks or months without a job, who's gone through surgery after surgery, and they're desperate with a young family, how can he say, I can rest? Unless, unless he knows that God has this, and he can trust him. So as we think about that this morning, I have a couple of questions for you to get us going. Do you believe that God is really in control? Like not just he's in control and God is sovereign, but is he really? If so, why do I scramble so desperately to get control? Why do I worry so much? I thought this weekend, and I'm going to ask you, is exercising our faith or, or, or practicing faith, trusting God, is that easier when times are difficult or when things are really easy? I wonder. 
I don't know if you're like me or not, but as I unpack this in my own heart, I think there's lots of times when life is good and things are really easy, I become really complacent. And when things are desperate is when my faith is awakened. But it's harder then, right? The storms and trials and difficulty, it's harder, but I'm desperate for God. And so faith comes into action play. Do you have a Bible with you? I hope that you do. If you don't, let us get you one from the back so that everybody has a Bible with them. If you can get up and grab one, that's great. If not, if you would put up your hand, if you would like to have one, um, Bob's on his way back there. He'll bring you one. Uh, The other thing is while we're doing that, um, if you are a kid here with us, we have some here as guests. Awesome. We're glad you're here. Uh, unfortunately, our children's ministry is at the 9 o'clock hour. And, but there are some baskets with coloring and those kind of things for you. Some of you have got them already. I saw that. And if you're a little older than those little baskets, then here's what we'll do. And many of you heard this lots of times. If you will take notes while I'm talking over the next half hour or so and show them to me later, I'll give you some Skittles. How's that? All right? I think the way we go through this this morning, you'll be able to track with us and it's not going to be difficult. If you got your Bibles, go to Psalm chapter 77. And this isn't the, the part of the Bible we're going to land on this morning. I want to still use this by way of introduction to get us thinking and engaging in this. But this is a really, really clear picture of what we're talking about here. In Psalm 77, this is not a psalm written by David. But this psalmist, we see right away in this psalm that he is in trouble. He's crying out to God, this is the day of trouble, I'm seeking God. He says in verse 2, my soul refuses to be comforted. He's really beside himself in this. I'm moaning and I'm remembering and my spirit faints. He says, I'm so troubled I can't speak in verse 4. And in verse 5 he says, I think back. I think back to the good old days. I think back to the better days. And I remember, and and I'm trying to remember the songs in my heart. And then verse 6, he says, So I stop and I do an internal search. I search my soul. I search my heart. But look at the answers. Look at what dug up. He says, Will God spurn me forever? Has God's love ceased? Has God forgotten me? I wonder if when we're in times of difficulty or times of fear or times of turbulence, our mind likes to roll in the wrong direction. And one thing leads to an X, and I think this, and then I think this, and we, we end up getting way off. And I see what happening, what's happening here is he stops. He knows this is hard and this is t- tough. This is difficult days. So I stop and I do a re-look inside, and he's saying, oh, is God's love stopped forever? But look at verse 10. Verse 10, he makes a decision to argue with himself. He says, I will appeal this, which literally means I will argue this down. And this is what he says. This is his argument to himself. I will remember what God has done. I will remember the marvels that I've seen. I will remember that God is holy. I will remember that God is always good. I will remember, remember, remember. My mind will be fixed on the truth. Interesting. Because everything within him is saying this is done. God's gone. God's forgotten. But he says, I will stop and I will argue. I will determine in my mind to set my mind on truth. I'm surrounded with difficulty, but I can see the truth. I will grab hold of the truth, and the truth is God has got this. Interesting, in the middle of this, I can rest. I'm still in deep, but I can rest. Only because he knows the truth and because he knows his God. So let's talk about that this morning. Just one simple principle that I want us to grab hold of this morning. And let's go and find it and look in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, if you will go and find that. This is where Peter walks on water. 
And while you're going there, I want to make a statement that's sort of like um, foundational to what we're going to look at this morning. Faith is the groundwork. Faith is the foundation for every aspect of the Christian life. Faith is the foundation for every aspect of the way of Jesus. Faith is the foundation and the groundwork before prayer. Faith is the foundation and the groundwork of worship. Faith is the foundation or groundwork of, of suffering, of sacrifice, of service, of tithing. It's the foundation before uh, generosity or miracles is faith. So here in this passage in Matthew 14, Jesus has just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a couple of fish. For his disciples, best day ever, right? As they dispersed this and then collected the baskets of leftovers, phenomenal day. And then we join this chapter in verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And on the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. A couple of things that I see here. As we look at this scenario, uh, it's the fourth watch. And in the Roman world, there were four watches overnight. And by time, this would have been somewhere between three and six in the morning. So they've been pushing against this wind in this storm and these waves all night long. And it's the deepest part of the night now. It's the deepest part of the night. They are absolutely exhausted after the best day ever, it now is the worst night ever. And to compound things, they're struggling, moving this, traveling on at night, not even during the day. And then if it can't get any worse, there's a ghost. And they're freaking out. It says they're screaming out, right? They're frantic. This is, in a sense, where it connects back to Psalm 77 for me. What's the situation here? I am surrounded with trouble and fear. So how did the psalmist respond to that? But I know who's in control. So the first thing Peter needed to do here in the boat was distinguish between the lies and the truth. Same as in Psalm 77. Distinguish between the lies and the truth. Once he knows this is Jesus, everything changes. This isn't the first time Jesus has calmed the storm. A few chapters ago in Matthew chapter 8, this is where Jesus was sleeping in the boat and the waves in the storm and they thought, we're going to die. Jesus gets up, commands the water quiet. So as soon as they see Jesus, as soon as they know it's Jesus... Everything changes. And so Peter actually gets out of the boat. That's easy to say, easy to read, easy to think about that. But if you think about that in the context of what's happening. Put yourself in that boat. In the fear, in the turmoil, in the waves, in the wind, in the storm. To actually let go of the boat. When we're floating in that situation, the only thing I've got is the boat. Are you like me? I'd be holding on to that thing for dear life. He actually lets go of it, seeing only Jesus. There's no doubt he was still afraid. 
I believe one of the great pictures of courage is to step into my fear knowing that God is bigger than what I'm afraid of. That's courage. I, I believe that that's faith. Stepping into this, knowing God is bigger than this, that's faith. The life of faith will do that. So if Peter was still only seeing the lies, if he was seeing the confusion and the exhaustion and the ghost, and his mind was still playing games with him and reading into all of this, he would have never, ever got out of the boat. But he saw Jesus, and he knew Jesus, and he trusted Jesus, and he let go of the boat the only thing that was keeping him floating. Note here, though, that Jesus doesn't calm the storm when he gets out of the boat. He doesn't calm the storm so he could get out of the boat. As a matter of fact, the storm was raging, and he gets out of the boat in the raging storm. I I don't know. I kind of always wish that when I see Jesus, the the storm's over, (laughs) right? That we pray that the storm would be over. But actually what Jesus calls Peter to here to is get out, step out, let go of the boat in the middle of the storm. So Peter's out there, he's standing on the water in verse 30. Maybe there's a crack of thunder and lightning and then a huge wave comes and hits him behind the knees and it topples him a little bit and instantly he's distracted. His focus was on Jesus, but now he's distracted. And the fear and the lies pop up again, and he starts to go under. I think the second thing here that Peter needs to do is see past the distractions. There's huge waves. The boat is my security, and it's way back there. The wind and the lightning and the thunder and the darkness. And, and you know what? Often I think we take this passage and we, we concentrate on or, or we zero in on the fact that Peter doubted. And Jesus says, you have little faith. And he sunk. The truth is, he got out of the boat, right? And the truth is, here's the good part. Even when he was distracted and started to go under, Jesus has got this. Jesus was right there. And picked him up. The last thing I see here is Peter needed to take action. He needed to step beyond his doubt. Despite his fear, despite the situation, he had to actually do what Jesus asked. Can you list the things that were doubtful here? What would Peter have doubted? What was going through Peter's minds? His mind, not he didn't have minds. What are the straightforward, logical, normal, scientific, proven, tested, experienced things about water? If you're focused on that, you're not getting out of the boat. Because this goes against everything that he has ever learned and experienced. Get out of the boat. Right here, in this room, nobody's physically holding onto a boat. But I think it's safe to say that we all are holding tightly to some things that are our our security. They're the only thing keeping me afloat. What would it look like to let go of that and to walk in faith? So out of these three things here, which one do you see would be the most critical? One of these holds up the other two. One of these comes before the other two. If we could learn to distinguish the truth from the lies, then I think we have a little bit of ability now to push past the distractions. Once we see the lies and the truth, then we can actually step into it. And this is what I saw back in Psalm 77. I am surrounded by everything bad, God has disappeared. God has forgotten me. His love has stopped. He's spurning me and will forever. Lie, 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 lie. Count them. And when we look at it like this, it's out of her obvious. But boy, when we're wrapped up in a situation, those lies come. And they're all we can dwell on and all we can, and we can't call them out as lies. That's a whole different thing. 
The starting point for all of this is distinguishing truth from lies. The key one for Peter? It's a ghost. It's not a ghost. It's Jesus. That changed everything. In Mark Buchanan's book, Hidden from Plain Sight, he says this. Faith's value is rooted in the soundness and worthiness of its object. Faith's value is rooted in the soundness and worthiness of its object. Every time I go to the bank and put money in, I'm exercising or practicing faith that the bank is secure. But the more I do it, every time we do it and nothing bad happens, I gain more trust, right? I gain more confidence in it. I remember the first time I went ice fishing. And uh, it was a cold day. We were in Alberta and we were on Ghost Lake. I remember the day and I'm in my friend's truck. And we go out there and he drives down the ramp and right out onto the ice. And I am freaking out. We drove out into the middle of this lake. And we're in his truck. The ice was capable of holding up the truck because it was almost four feet thick. That didn't matter to me. We're on the ice. But here's my point. It absolutely was strong enough. It absolutely was. The object of the faith there was the ice, and it was worthy. So Peter here lived alongside Jesus. He saw Jesus prove himself over and over and over and over, and he gained every day more confidence, more trust, deeper faith, that he could come to the place where he could do whatever Jesus asked. Faith's value is rooted in the soundness and worthiness of its object. The soundness of the ice on that lake? Yes, there's risk. But the truth was, it's worthy. The soundness of the security of my bank? Yes, there's risk. But the truth is, it's worthy. The soundness in the person and power of Jesus is worthy. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 quickly. I won't stay here for long. Or chapter 11, sorry. I mean, how could you talk about faith without looking at Hebrews chapter 11? From beginning to end, this is one person after another after another who stepped out in faith and great examples of faith. But I don't want to look at the obvious things here. I want to find something in the middle of it that's a little bit more obscure. Something I, I'm not even sure that I grasped until this week as I was studying. Look at verse 6 in chapter 11. It says, without faith it's impossible to please him. Now I've heard that, preached that, talked about that. It's the next part of the verse I want to look at. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the key here. If I'm going to draw close to God, I have to first believe he exists. This is not the, oh, I believe God is there. This word here exists in, in the original Greek, this actually just says you have to believe God is. Now, that's a weighted statement. God is. Because God is sovereign. God is in control. God is God. And in order to draw close to him, we have to believe that God is God of everything. And he is God of me, and he has got this. I think the number one lie keeping us from experiencing a life of faith, number one lie keeping us maybe from praying or from generosity or from sharing our faith, is actually just simply what we believe about God. God is worthy of our trust. Do I question the soundness and the worthiness of faith in Jesus? So how did Peter get to the place where he actually believed enough to get out of the boat? In Matthew 14, we see he, they're in the storm and he gets out of the boat. If we rewind back to Matthew chapter 8, just a few chapters back, we have another situation where they're in the boat, they're in a storm, and this time Jesus is with them and he's sleeping, um, he's sleeping in the boat. And in this raging storm, they are at freak out stage because it says, we are going to die. 
Jesus wakes up and calms the storm. And if you can see there, if you're there, the result in the hearts and minds of the disciples in chapter 8 when he calms the storm is, what kind of man is this? Okay, think about that for a second. Now go back to chapter 14. As Jesus comes walking on the water and he gets in the boat and the water's calm and this whole thing with Peter and everything's done, Jesus calms the storm and their response is completely different. This time he says, you are the son of God. There's a big leap there. And I think what we need to do is we need to move from seeing Jesus as a great man or a good teacher or a miracle worker And move towards seeing him as God, as the Son of God, as Lord, as creator, as sovereign, as completely in control. It's when we get that, when we sort that out, when we believe that, we can actually step into faith. It's not a ghost in the mist on the lake when I'm scared and exhausted. He's not just a great man or a great teacher. He is God himself, and he holds the universe in the palm of his hands. So when God asks you, or when trouble comes, or when we're we're afraid, or when I don't know where my next meal is going to come from, or when God nudges me out of my comfort zone to, to go or to give or to talk or to do, to go back to the point in, in Psalm 77, I will argue with myself and remember God is. Let me look at one more thing. I'll pull this together, just a couple more minutes. Because there's something in all of this that I see so consistently and I see consistently in my own life that often the way of following Jesus goes against my normal way of thinking. Does that make sense? I mean, we see, we see Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Someone asks you for your jacket, give them your shirt too. These are just, down, uh, they're against the way we are, right? And our normal way of thinking. But maybe even more than that, following the way of Jesus often stands in the way of my better judgment, of my logic, my understanding, my experience, my brains, my best calculations. Often the way of Jesus is in opposition to that. Just ask Noah. God says, build an ark. A what? Read that story. In that context, in the world of that day, that was absolutely absurd. Or to to come to Abraham and say, collect your stuff and your family and go. I'll show you where as you get there. Or to Moses, go back to Egypt. Pardon me? And talk about going against my better judgment, right? To Joshua, great military leader commanding the armies of his country. God says, yeah, just get everybody, kids too, and walk around the city for a week. It goes against our logic. It goes against our better judgment and our understanding and our experience. How about Gideon? No, no, no. You've got too many men. Take these 300 against this massive army, and all I want the guys to take with them is a torch and a pickle pot. Do you ever struggle with decisions when my understanding and my experience and using my brain is opposite to what God is saying? Turn over to Proverbs chapter 3. Last time I'll make you do your finger work this morning. Proverbs chapter 3. I know this verse is very uh, familiar to many of you. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. What is that verse really saying? That once I embrace who God really is, I can trust him above my experience and my understanding and my knowledge and my learning. This tells me to trust him first, not my smarts, 
Not my calculations, not my understanding. Note this does not say, don't use your brain. It doesn't say, don't use your experience and your understanding. But it says, act on what you know is true. Use your head. You know God has got this. Act on that. So what do I do when my logic and my understanding says stop and I know Jesus is saying go? Which comes first when you're making a decision and we've got this grid of things that our decision passes through? What comes first? If you're like me, I think most of us, very naturally, my logic and my experience and my understanding comes first. Or does Jesus? Which is the dominant factor in your decision process? I think our tendency is when waters get rough, we scramble. We try to regain control. We start to freak out. Then we're screaming. But Jesus is right there. Should I be alarmed? Well, maybe if Jesus was alarmed, then there's reason to be alarmed. But he's got this. So when God nudges you, and you know it, do we start with our skills and our brains and our understanding? Do we scramble for control or safety or familiar territory? Or do we chase after Jesus as a last resort? Or, or sometimes maybe we chase after Jesus and we trust in him, but we put a time limit on it. Okay, for the next three days, God, will, but after that, right? I think we trust in our skills and our smarts way too much, but when we do, we are doubting Jesus. Move from seeing him as a great man towards seeing him as the only one who can. Trust him, know him, follow him, walk in the way of Jesus. So in what way might God be asking us to get out of the boat today? Instead of holding desperately onto the boat, the only thing that's keeping my head above water, instead of holding desperately, how about holding on to the truth of our Savior? Can you trust him with your life? This is faith. Step into it. Let me give you two examples. Very quickly. We're in the building campaign right now. And... As this progresses towards the banquet in October, we will ask you to make a pledge financially towards the building. Here's how faith comes into that. Because as my wife and I sit down, uh, and I'll tell you about this again in a couple of weeks, but as my wife and I sit down to figure out what we can contribute to this, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'll do all the math, I'll look at the budget, I'll figure things out, and I'll say, here's what I know we can do. That's the easy part. But I want to challenge you to step out beyond that. I want to say, and this is what my wife and I are doing, what things can we change in our life day to day that is a sacrifice? That may make things uncomfortable or difficult, but we're willing to sacrifice that, and I'm going to add that to what I know I can do. But we're still at the place where I, I, I got this, right? Because if I cut cable and I put that money, I, I still I know I can do this. But I want to challenge you now to add something more that I cannot do because of faith. That now, if I'm going to be able to give that, I have to get out of the boat. I have to trust. The second way I want to illustrate this really for us today is that this capital campaign I've said over and over and over for me, this is about the spiritual journey. As I said earlier today, the consecration of this, the faith, the stewardship, the sacrifice, all of this, all of these things are spiritual issues. They are following Jesus issues. They are the way of Jesus. And I want to encourage you to step beyond your normal in that, more than anything else. To step beyond your normal as we engage here on Sunday mornings. Step beyond your normal as you do this kind of thing. Don't just sit down at home and spend my nice little time like I always would. Get together with two or three or others and go through it together. And, and take a step into that. Watch the videos and engage. There will be home visits coming up. And these are not about the money. They're about the spiritual journey. Engage in those. Pray together. Ministry together. Be together. There's a prayer vigil. There's lots of committee work. But engage in this. The together, the community, the journey part of this. 
beyond what you're already doing. Be open to what God has to say. So whether you agree with the building expansion or not, will you dig deeply into the study part of this, the seeking God part of this, the community part of this, see what God does, to go honestly into the walk of discipleship and to hear his voice. These are all discipleship spiritual issues. And clearly, the way of Jesus. Let's do that together. God will change us. God will change our church. You know the song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus? Why? Because he's proved it over and over, right? That's what I'm talking about this morning. So when we're struggling to make those decisions, when we're struggling with faith, when God is asking us to step into the unknown a little bit, he has proved it over and over and over. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. As in that boat, there is unsafety. In the arms of Jesus, there is safety. Let's live our lives that way. Step out in faith, regardless of what's going on around you. Can you trust him with your life? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you have proved it over and over and over. In many of our lives, we have seen your work firsthand. God, would you bring those things quickly to mind? God, may we have the ability to step into the unknown as long as we know that you are calling us there. We want to hear your voice clearly. We want to know your voice. We want to respond with action, even if it's outside my normal, even if it's outside uh, my comfort zone, even if it's outside my logical thinking. May we listen to your voice and do what you say. God, I'm assuming that most of these folks here today, like me, need a lot of help with that. We are desperate for you. Thank you that even in the middle of the waves, you had Peter. When he got distracted and he fell he, and he got his eyes off of you and he sunk, boy, we do that all the time, you were there to grab him. You've got this. Teach us day after day after day to have more confidence in who you are to trust you more, to live the life of faith. This is the way of Jesus. Maybe God even let us live with a little reckless abandon for the sake of your kingdom. And we wait eagerly with great anticipation to see what you're going to do. Amen.